Good morning, and uh, several people have asked me if my last name, Johansson, had any connection to Sweden, and indeed it does. Um, that's, those are my roots, just as they are many of your roots. Uh, my family came from Norshirping, where I'm going on Saturday, so for me it's always a thrill to come back to what I really call my homeland. And uh, we've had a glorious couple of days, and I've been really looking forward to speaking to all of you. Part of my career has been focused primarily on outreach. I think it's, it's a scientist's responsibility to be able to translate our particular science into ways that other people can understand it and understand the importance of it, not only in science, but also for themselves. It really enriches our way of understanding the universe, uh, the origins of life we heard a great deal about this morning, and it establishes our place in the universe. Uh, I'm not going to talk a great deal about Lucy, but I'm going to uh, show a few slides, and then I'm going to reflect a little bit on the meaning of understanding our earliest ancestors, particularly the, the legacy that Lucy has left us. Uh, my particular study, uh, paleoanthropology as it's called, which is not the study of old anthropologists, but the study of human origins, was something that sparked my interest as a very young person. And I can say younger than probably everyone sitting in this audience. I was 13 years old. I read a book that my mentor had given me called Man's Place in Nature. And the seminal point of that book was that humans, like all other life on the planet, evolved, and that our closest living relatives were the African apes. And that was incredibly interesting to me as a 13-year-old even though I was busy in, and I won't mention chemistry too many times, but even though I was busy in physics and chemistry and winning both of those prizes in high school, lingering in the back of my mind was always to pursue the search for our earliest and most ancient ancestors and to establish ourselves within the world of nature. I did go to the University of Illinois for a year as a chemistry major, I saw that big, thick organic chemistry book, and I said, well, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. So I wandered over to the anthropology department and uh, began to study anthropology seriously. I have put my uh, email address up there so that if any of you have questions uh, that don't get answered today or would like to stay in touch or have questions in the future, feel free to email me. We have a fairly good understanding of roughly the last four million years. We heard today about billions of years, so we're talking about a much shorter period of time, uh, that goes back to about four million years. And we see that there are creatures walking around upright, like we are, uh, that are spread across Africa. And they have a modern sort of way of getting around. They're not using their hands for climbing and grasping feet, but they had a very ape-like skull with a massive face and a small brain. And we think, mostly on the basis of looking at genetics and so on, that the last common ancestor was somewhere between five and eight million years ago, between ourselves and the apes. And uh, our own genus, Homo, which is Latin for man, appears the oldest evidence, which we found a couple of years ago in Ethiopia, is about 2.8 million years. And then around 200 to 300,000 years ago, which is fairly recent, uh, modern humans, as Linnaeus called us, supposedly wise men, Homo sapiens. And uh, here we are. Obviously, the place to look for our earliest ancestors, you heard about looking for some of the earliest and most ancient rocks on the planet, uh, was Africa. This was, this was a prognostication by uh, Charles Darwin that since we most closely resemble African apes, that's the place to look. And uh, the first fossils were found in the 1920s. 
And in the 1970s, I began working right up here, which is the northern part of the East African Rift Valley, where very ancient four, five, six million year old geological deposits that were laid down by lakes and rivers are, are located. And this was the area that interested me most. Uh, the name of the site is Hadar, that's a local place name. But you see those strata of sands and silts and clays and volcanic ashes and so on that are scattered over about 60 square kilometers. And I knew from the fossils on the surface of the ground, like antelopes and particularly um, pigs and elephants, that it was older than three million. And I have led a series of expeditions to this area and was very fortunate in 1974, which means this year we are celebrating the 45th anniversary of her discovery. And one really wonders where did those 45 years go? I wish I could say I found her when I was five, but that wasn't the case. Um, she was uh, one of the most complete skeletons that have been found of such great antiquity. She's definitely a female because of her diminutive size. And after several years of research with uh, a number of good colleagues, um, we decided that this was a new kind of human ancestor, a new species. And we called it Afarensis after that Afar triangle and published that in 1978, which is also a very important year in my career because in May, which means here we are in May in 1978, I was invited uh, by the Nobel uh, Foundation and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences to participate in a symposium that took place in Karlskoga. Um, and it was there that I made the public, and, oh, this is a, the kind of world that Lucy lived in, very different from what you saw. You see a couple of Lucy-like creatures, but my friend uh, Maurizio, Anton, uh, let me use this image, a wonderful paleo artist. But at that symposium, at this precise moment when this photograph was taken, it was middle May um, in 1978, I announced Lucy as a new species. So this is a very important year for me in terms of coming to this wonderful symposium with the generous invitation of, of Lori and Bengt and others to celebrate in my own way that very important moment when I announced Lucy as a new, spe new species and redrew the geometry of the human family tree. This is obviously what we are trying to do. This is a hypothesis uh, that I generated in 1978. I suggested that Lucy's species, Australopithecus afarensis, was the last common ancestor to two branches one that led to uh, the genus Homo, which we now have fairly good confidence in, and one that led to another branch of Australopithecus, all those species of which died out. And what has been so gratifying to me as a scientist is, and you heard earlier about hypotheses that are tested, is that that hypothesis did not have these intermittent fossils here. Uh, it's only subsequently that other discoveries have been made by my team and other teams that have tested this hypothesis. It hasn't proven anything, but it has tested the hypothesis, which still seems to be probably our best introduction or our best conclusions about early human lineages, something that we could not do previously. But today, I'm going to focus more on talking about this wonderful painting by Gauguin. We as humans all ask that question, where did we come from? Who are we and where are we going? And the sorts of discoveries that I have made in Africa have been extremely important for science, greatly, very important for you know, communicating the message about human origins to people. But they also, I think, have urged me to be more contemplative and to think about what Lucy teaches us about ourselves. Is there some message in those fossils that helps us better understand 
how we've become a species in control of the future of all life on this planet. Um, and where do we fit into the rhythms of the earth? And is there something connecting us to nature that transcends time and distance? And interestingly, only humans ask those questions. And uh, we're the only species who seems to exhibit an interest in learning about its origins. No other species has so much to learn from its past as we do. Yet, unfortunately, we ignore what the past is telling us because we have so much to lose by ignoring the origins of our deep connection to the natural world. In many ways, humans are a strange species. Uh, we are the only real vertebrate on the planet that doesn't have some sort of natural birth control or natural control. We are outside of natural selection. We, we don't have reproductive controls on our species, which is danger, as we all know. But we are very different from other animals because we are so highly creative. Because, and I think that that is where everyone's asking the question about what makes humans so unique. I think there are three things. One of them is our use of symbolic language, which we are all doing up here today. Uh, no other animals communicate in that way. And that we depend on cumulative culture. Just in the last hundred years, look at what technology has done. That we build upon earlier discoveries or innovations, and we ratchet that up very quickly. So the cultural evolution is very, very quick. And also, we are the most cooperative species, vertebrate species on the planet. You can use that for good, or you can use it for bad. And if you look at our closest living relatives, which would be the chimpanzee, they're in, in great contrast, not very cooperative. We will cooperate with anybody on the planet, even if we don't know them, and we only meet them on the internet and exchange emails or Skype calls or whatever. Chimpanzees, who are closest, who's our, our closest living relatives, if you're a male chimpanzee and you wander into a troop of other chimpanzees, those chimpanzees will kill you and eat you. So that is something very unique about humans. And I think it's the combination, the synthesis of those three things, symbolic language, cumulative culture, and um, cooperation that work together. But our remarkable success as a species, if you consider 7.2 billion of us successful, um, doesn't come without a dark side. We have a false sense of security, really. And we believe that since we've survived the whims and caprices of evolutionary change over the last six million years, why should we worry? Uh, some anthropologists uh, have suggested that because culture is so innovative and so powerful and so productive and so innovative, that we have actually risen above culture above nature, that we are superior to the natural world. When I was a student, an undergraduate, we used a textbook by Alfred Kerber, and he said that humans were super organic, beyond biology. And I remember arguing as an undergraduate with a professor, because of my background in natural history as a child, that we were an intimate part of the natural world. And he believed that once culture comes in that door, biology jumps out the window, and that we don't have to worry about biology and by implication, the natural world. And I don't know how many of you have seen a wonderful movie called The African Queen, in which Catherine Hepburn and Humphrey Bogart appeared. And uh, she was a very religious woman, and he was kind of a character. And uh, he was talking about nature to her. And she says, nature, Mr. Allnut, is what the Lord put us on the earth to rise above. How wrong was that? So our meteoric ascent over the last 12,000 years is, does not in any way override completely 
the six million years of natural selection that has crafted us to be who we are today. It's not as if all of a sudden the process that Darwin articulated in 1859 stops. We still carry the genes in our bodies that were crafted by natural selection to make us successful creatures. That we are, when you look at the fact that for six million years or so, we have lived under natural conditions as an intimate part of the natural world and that the biological forces that crafted us just simply don't disappear because we become culture-bound animals. I don't want to give you the impression that I am a you know, card-carrying uh, sociobiologist who says that genes determine everything. But just because we live in a highly technological world doesn't mean that biology is no longer a factor in what makes us human. I think that human evolution is unique and different from classical biological evolution because it is a combination of cultural evolution and biological evolution. And there's a great synergy there, a powerful synergy that makes us so unique. But there are some fundamental differences between biological and cultural evolution. Biological evolution under the guise of natural selection is a very slow process, whereas cultural evolution is a very rapid. And I think there's a real imbalance among humans between what we have achieved culturally and what the natural world has given us that's encoded in our DNA. And I think that is part of the reason that humans are in such trouble. That we have such arrogance about the world. You know, we may live in modern cities like this beautiful city here, Stockholm, uh, but in many respects, I think we operate with a Stone Age mind. We're still living out on the savanna grasslands here in Africa as hunter-gatherers. Our rapidly um, increasing or accelerating technological evolution has, in other words, rapidly outstripped our biological evolution. And I think that imbalance is very important to recognize. We have left footprints on the moon, which is another interesting anniversary this year. It is the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission when we first landed people on the moon. But we've left footprints on the moon yet 12,000 years ago, which is a blink of a geological eye. We were all hunter-gatherers every place we went on the planet. People were living as hunter-gatherers or hunter-fishers or whatever, but we were living in small groups as hunter-gatherers. And yet today, we're exploring space. And I wonder if a psyche that evolved in the Paleolithic can successfully cope with the modern world. When and how will we overcome some of those primitive urges and replace them with an enlightened compassion for our fellow man, which seems to be more important now than ever before in human history? I think in some ways we are hampered by our atavistic tendencies, tendencies that lurk in our DNA, behaviors that certainly helped our ancestors, but in, modern, in the modern world today, these evolutionary holdovers are simply inappropriate. Our ancestors, if we go back for the millions of years that they lived as hunter-gatherers, they lived in challenging environments. They lived in African environments with lots of dangers around them and very little in terms of technology to help them or they lived in glacial environments in Europe, like the Neanderthals. And uh, they, had, they had to struggle. And they were always on high alert. And they were living in a survival-oriented world. And I think they, they stockpiled food when they needed to be. And, and that idea, that tendency to keep food, is maybe led to the xenophobia that we feel about the other and protecting our own. Um, in the past, there was always competition for food and a real problem of, uh, of greed 
in terms of which may have led to greed with people storing these food items, for example. And this is especially true today, as we all know, of capitalist societies, where what is most important, and I come from one of the classic capitalist societies, is the profit margin rather than the implications of what that means. Uh, when I was living in Berkeley, California, one of my favorite bumper stickers was live simply, simply that others can live. And I think today that's becoming even more re relevant. Well, if we don't appreciate or revere culture, uh, nature, we're must, much less, we have a lower tendency to look after the natural world uh, and guard the very ecosystems that played and will continue to play a crucial role in our survival on this planet. We have moved so away, far away from the, cult, from the natural world that there is even an imbalance in the way we look at the world we live in. We have the idea that technology will solve everything. Um, many years ago, um, Ed Wilson, probably known to many of you, suggested that there is an, a, a very definite atavistic source among people to uh, be in touch with nature. And don't we all feel differently when springtime comes and we leave the confines of our houses, our apartments, and so on, and begin to be reconnected to the natural world? And the natural world has been so heavily impacted by humans that it's truly unbelievable what has happened. Uh, for instance, once we started settling down and started domesticated anim domesticating animals and growing grains and so on, and that's 12,000 years ago, it was a Neolithic revolution, right? At that time, domesticated animals and humans constituted about a tenth of 1% of the mammalian biomass on the planet. All the other biomass the 90 some, 99 plus percent were wild animals. Today, only 600 generations later, it's the complete reverse. Humans and domesticated animals comprise 96% of the mammalian biomass, with the remainder consisting of wild animals, some three to 4%. And even more alarming is the fact in the last couple hundred years, and particularly even since 1970, the populations of animals, the numbers of animals, have been diminished by some 60%. When I picked up the New York Times just before I got on a plane to come here, there was a major announcement, which I'm sure many of you in this room saw, published by the United Nations. And it was entitled, Nature's Dangerous Decline, Unprecedented Species Extinction Rates Are Accelerating. And that global response is really insufficient at the moment. As someone said, it's, it's like running around putting out little fires. We need a, a transformative approach to saving this planet, which means saving ourselves. So that there, we're at a very dangerous point in the evolution of the planet. We're maybe close to a million species in the next 10 years could go extinct. And another favorite bumper sticker of mine is that extinction is forever. Once a creature goes extinct on this planet, it never evolves again. Um, and if we look back over the last couple of hundred years, which is nothing compared to the three and a half billion years we were hearing about earlier this morning, we see that just 200 years ago, people were writing about ships in the North Atlantic, for example, crossing from Europe into the New World, where codfish were so thick, these sailing ships were stopped Today, the codfish is almost gone. If we look um, at reports from early whalers outside of Australia, the pods of, of enormous sperm whales went from horizon to horizon. Uh, earlier, early settlers in the United States, 
the records they left settling Washington, Oregon, Northern California, where I live, and using canoes to go up rivers, were terrified because there were so many salmon boiling in the water that they thought they would have their canoes turned over. Where have all those animals gone and who's responsible for it? We know who's responsible for it. So as, as you heard in the lovely introduction by the president of your uh, university here, that um, we have witnessed extinctions over and over on this planet. Some periods of immense extinction. And uh, to make room, as she said it so eloquently, for other species to have a chance. And if we look at the dinosaur extinctions, that certainly led to the rise of mammals. So we've survived thus far. We've escaped that grim reaper that we call extinction. But for how long will that continue? This report in the New York Times that came out of the United Nations is, is very worrisome. And if that doesn't alert more and more people, we may not be a species 100 years from now, or a very different species. Um, we just blatantly use the Earth's resources, resources that have kind of a, a finite life. And also, many of the resources, as you'll notice, that used to be free, we have to pay for. Clean air, clean water, space to live, food, and so on. So it's changed dramatically. And, as a, and it has continued to move us away in a very, very rapid way from the natural world. And we have forgotten, or most people have forgotten, that connection. I talked about Ed Wilson, who said that there is this tendency, which he called biophilia, to be in touch with the natural world. And we're finding psychologists who study people who have intense depression, anxiety, and worry. And for some of these people, they have suggested ecotherapy that they need to go back out into the natural world and get away from this high-speed technological world in which we live in. And they, some of that unhappiness, they think, is associated with the absence of contact with the natural world. This deep-seated urge, I think, that we all have uh, in our genes to be in touch with nature, nature needs to be nourished, in my view. We need to sit around a campfire instead of a TV. We need to smell that natural wood smoke, listen to the night sounds, rather than the sirens and the garbage trucks that plague our cities. Look up into the velvet sky of the night and see a myriad of scars and an occasional meteor. These moments will calm our spirit, I feel, and bring back some equilibrium between the modern world and the world that shaped our ancestors for millions of years. Evolution, it's very interesting, you know, in our country, I lectured in Denmark uh, last May, and sometimes in a public lecture I will say, how many of you in the audience believe in evolution? And it was heartening in Copenhagen because every hand went up. And in America, people are almost afraid to raise their hand. But there are many people, of course, who do not. And I, I make that question specifically, do you believe in evolution? And then after they put their hands down, I'll say it will come as a shock to you that I don't believe in evolution any more than I believe in gravity. You don't have to believe in these things which are laws of the universe. And one has to get away from the idea, the classic idea you see in so many books of an ape getting more and more upright and at the end of evolution is a white European male, right? It's always a white European male. Why? Because white European males draw those pictures. That there is no destiny. Evolution doesn't have a goal in mind. It wasn't consistently crafting us to become humans. It was just dealing with animals and plant adaptations to the particular world in which they lived. So 
while we are the most intelligent, we're also at the same time the most dangerous and at the same time the most cooperative animals to walk the earth. But we're probably not the end of life's three billion year adventure. Our species in some ways is still an evolutionary work in progress. And I'm convinced that an understanding of the ancient evolutionary legacy that still resides in our modern psyche and our genes is vitally important for our survival, indeed the survival of all life on the planet. We've inherited, not because we asked, but we've inherited this remarkable, awesome responsibility as the most intelligent creature on the planet. As far as we know, the most intelligent creature in the universe. It is possible, obviously, this is a great question to ponder sometime over a couple of glasses of aquavit. Um, we are part of the continuum of life. We think of ourselves as unique and separate and different. And that's a huge danger to our survival and the survival of life on this planet. The more we see ourselves as part of the natural world, the more we will respect and care for that natural world. As an anthropologist, I can assure you that when you look at a family tree of humans, it's much more complex than I showed you, any branch that you grasp will lead back to the roots in Africa. Every one of us in this room carries in our genome progenitor African genes that evolved millions of years ago. The highest frequency of those genes are found in African populations, particularly in South Africa. And it's like throwing a pebble into a pond where the, the highest amplitude of that wave is where the pebble went in. And as you move away, the frequency diminishes just as the frequency of genes, progenitor genes. But that means that we, homo sapiens, who revere ourselves so much, share a common origin, a common background. We are all Africans in this room. We are all very closely related, no matter what our skin color or shape of eye or whatever. And we need to ponder more deeply and introspectively the view that perhaps if we had a common ancestry, we have a common destiny. Humans are consumed by an egocentric view that we're the pinnacle of evolution and why should we worry? Rather than calling ourselves homo sapiens, wise man, maybe we should be called homo egocentricus. I also think that part of the problem is that we live such a very short time. We live in about five generations of people. We think about ourselves, right, more than anybody else. We have our parents and our grandparents and our children and our grandchildren. And over those short periods of time, you don't see much change in terms of species, for example, but look at the impact we've had on the planet. Dinosaurs dominated our planet for 165 million years. When that killer asteroid came hurtling towards us, they had no means of escape. In contrast, modern humans, whose world domination began a mere 10,000 years ago, have the ability to prevent our extinction. Yet in our arrogance, we're doing little to prevent the coming apocalypse. We are the most intelligent animals to have ever lived, comfortable with killing off the only life we know of in the universe. Some say we are literally committing a slow suicide. Two truisms. Humans have no other place to go. Look at all these planets here. All these, don't you wish we had worlds like that? We have no place to move to. We have to stop thinking, well, things will get bad and we'll just find another place to live. There's no other place to live, except as Carl Sagan, that pale blue dot. And also, no supernatural force or person or creature or whatever is going to save us. We are going to go extinct, just like other animals, unless we prepare. So in my opinion, and this is my conclusion, we need to reinvent a reverence for our true creator, 
nature and begin to embrace sustainable solutions to our problems so that our descendants, your descendants, will look back on their ancestors with respect rather than anger. Thank you very much.